Hey everyone, this is going to be a talk about Caracol, which is a new uh, static analysis framework for uh, Cairo and StarkNet. So I'm just going to go over the agenda really quickly today. I'm going to give a brief introduction, talk about some common vulnerabilities that uh, happen on uh, like the StarkNet. I'm going to talk about Caracol. I'll get into that, what that is, but it's a new static analysis tool we developed. I'm going to show you a demo, and then I'm going to talk more about Roadmap and our future plans. So who am I? My name is Justin. I'm a security engineer at Trail of Bits, although this badge says Starkware. Uh, my interests are blockchains, program analysis, cryptography, zero knowledge proofs, pretty much just everything that comes out of the blockchain space. Obviously, I have an interest in Cairo and Starknet as well. There's my Twitter if you want to connect or talk after. Uh, if you haven't heard of Trail of Bits, our job is to help people build safer, more secure software. So we're a traditional, like, uh, security company, and we do a lot of research and development as well. This research and development in, uh, inherently makes us uh, build our own tools, and we open source them. So in the blockchain space, uh, particularly, some of our tools are fairly like popular. You might have heard of like Slither, Echidna, Medusa, Teeler. And if you want to uh, follow the rest of our blockchain team on uh, Twitter, there's a QR code for you. So I assume uh, most people here are familiar with Cairo. If not, that's perfectly fine. I'm just going to give a little bit of background. So Cairo is a programming language for uh, zero-knowledge proofs. What that means is you want to, a prover wants to convince a verifier that some computation is done correctly. And you can write a Cairo program. It'll basically compile down into a, something that is very easy to generate a zero-knowledge proof for. So because Cairo is a programming language for zero-knowledge proofs, it's not, it's, there are some differ, uh, differences between that and like a traditional programming language. There's these features called hints, which basically means a prover gets to write to the memory directly. Uh, the memory model is also slightly unique. You can think of it as being immutable. Like once you write to the, a memory cell, that memory cell will stay, have that value forever. And there's also been a lot of different versions of the language. So when Cairo just came out, I don't remember exactly when, but there was uh, Cairo Zero, which was a very like bare bones Pythonic language where you had to directly write to the memory cell and then update the, where the memory cell points to. Uh, recently, Cairo 1 released, which is like a complete overwrite of the syntax, so it's now like higher level and more Rust-based. And then Cairo 2 uh, also just came out recently, which is like adding more extensibility onto the language. So uh, you would, Starknet is the uh, ZK rollup that will help scale Ethereum. And what you would do is you would write a smart contract in Cairo, you'd deploy it to the Starknet blockchain, and those, uh, they're just smart contracts they can execute periodically. Uh, after every uh, after a group of transactions, uh, they'll be batched. A zero knowledge proof will be generated for them, and that proof will be submitted to Ethereum L1. So this helps scale Ethereum at, because you can basically have a bunch more transactions on the L2, and then just generate a proof for them that'll be submitted on L1. So now that we have some background, I'd like to talk about some of the common vulnerabilities because this should be a surprise to probably no one. But smart contracts have bugs, and Starknet smart contracts are no exception to that. These bugs can have many different forms, but they're particularly devastating because they can lead to people either losing money, other people stealing money, and just overall uh, circumstances that we'd like to avoid. Some of the bugs are actually like similar to other smart contract languages and just smart contracts in general, but naturally, because we're working in a different paradigm, some of these vulnerabilities are also more Cairo specific. So the first bug I want to talk about is a pretty common bug. This occurs in traditional programming, too which is the idea of overflow or underflow. So the reason this happens is because we only have a finite amount of space on like a CPU or a VM. So we can only uh, have operations that fit into a specific type. So in Cairo, that is this really big hexadecimal number, which is the maximum. It's a 252-bit number. And any operation whose value is bigger than that will wrap around. So, and any operation who also goes below 0 will wrap back around as well. So something that's nice about uh, Cairo 1 and beyond is that the, you have uh, these things called unsigned integer types, which is different than the native FEL-252 type. If you use an integer type, it will actually have overflow protection built in, but the native FELT type doesn't. So here's a very uh, like simple example. So as you can see, we're, we're going to declare a variable called A, which is the max FELT-252, and then we're going to add 1. And then we're going to have B, which is 0, and we're going to do minus 1 on it. So let's see what this results in. As you can see, a, the maximum felt plus 1 will wrap back around to 0, and then 0 minus 1 will roll all the way back around to this really big number. So another vulnerability that. Is there anything uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? 
So in general, uh, the, uh, the question was, uh, why would you use belts instead of you? In general, like you would use uh, uints now because they're kind of built into the language. It's kind of a legacy thing from Cairo Zero where there were there were other bugs because uints had to be represented as two felts. So it's kind of just like a legacy thing. But yeah, uints are better because they have uh, protection built in. So uh, another vulnerability I'd like to talk about, which is also probably particularly famous and kind of nasty, is reentrancy. What a reentrancy is is say let's say let's say you have a variable that is read before an external call and then written to right after the external call. What can happen is the external function can call back into the original function, which hasn't updated its state variable. So this is uh, a little bit abstract, but we'll go into a concrete example soon. One thing I would like to mention is that there is some nuance on reentrancies. So there is something called read-only reentrancy, where you can re-enter into a view function and read a stale value. There's also reentrancy for events, which can lead to events being emitted out of order. So here is a minimal example of a reentrancy. As you can see, we have this state variable called a, and we're going to read it. Then we're going to make an external call to another contract before uh, the state gets updated. So we can call back into reentrant using the stale value of a, and you can imagine this can be kind of bad because. If A is something like a balance that hasn't been reset to zero, then we can just keep calling the contract over and over again until we drain all the funds. So this is actually a StarkNet-specific vulnerability, which is that the from address can be unchecked in an L1 handler function. So the reason this happens is because, let's say you want to send a message from Ethereum to StarkNet. These are both isolated blockchains, so they have no way of communicating between them. What happens is, to send a message from Ethereum L1 to the StarkNet L2, you'll send a message to this uh, contract, smart contract on L1. It'll emit an event. The StarkNet sequencer will pick up that event, and then it will call the function on L2 that has this L1 handler decorator. But every L1 handler decorator has a parameter called the from address, which is basically the address on L1 that sent the message. And so if this address isn't validated, then anyone can basically call this L2 contract. So you can think of this as a form of like improper access control. So here's another like uh, picture to make it clear. Let's say we have this uh, storage variable called L1 contract, and there's this L1 ha handler function. So the issue with this is that, as you can see, I don't do any checks on the from address. So let's say on L I call the start smart contract on L1, I send a message, and I put any address as the from address. Then when the StarkNet sequencer will call this uh, L1 handler function, that basically I can put in whatever address I want and write directly to the storage variable. So you can think of it as having no access control. And for example, if the storage variable was like something like an owner, this could obviously be problematic because it would let you take over the contract. So another StarkNet specific vulnerability I'd like to talk about is uh, this idea of a controlled library call. If uh, I imagine like there are some people here who are like a bit more familiar, familiar with Ethereum and like Solidity vulnerabilities, and this is kind of like a con like delegate call in Solidity. So what a library call lets you do is it lets you execute the logic of contract of some co other external contract within the same state as the current like execution environment. So to put that concretely, if I have a contract A that delegate calls contract B, the logic of contract B will be executed, but contract A's state will be modified. And this is obviously somewhat problematic because I basically let an external contract have complete control over my state and I can do whatever I want, which is not ideal. So this example is like just another example of uh, arbitrary uh, library call. So let's say I have this trait, which is another contract, and it's like a minimal interface with this function. So if I have the storage parameter that's, you know, it could represent anything important, and I make a controlled library call, as you can see, there's no checks on the class, ha class hash parameter. So that's like saying I can call any arbitrary address, and I can, but when I do a library call, I will basically be manipulating the current in execution environment storage. So when I do that uh, library call, as you can see, I call some arbitrary contract, and I can basically manipulate the important parameter to be whatever I want. So. All of these vulnerabilities obviously are problematic because they can lead to you know, loss of funds or just account takeovers. And so since our job is to uh, make the ecosystem more secure, we developed Caracol, which is a static analysis tool for Cairo smart contracts. So what a static analysis let tool lets you do is basically you can run it on any sort of Cairo smart contract, and it'll flag all these vulnerabilities for you. So we built it on top of the Sierra intermediate representation, so it works for Cairo 1 and Cairo 2. 
every vulnerability that I just mentioned we can detect. So let's say that if you accidentally introduce a, you know, an overflow or underflow, we can detect it statically. All it just takes is running our tool, and we'll be able to flag it for you. In addition, we also have some things that'll point out optimizations, like a detector for dead code or unused return or unused arguments. So you, that'll help you optimize your uh, Cairo smart contracts as well. Also, we have two printers so we have that I'll uh, be talking about soon. They're the control flow graph and the call graph. And if you use something like SCARB, it's actually extremely simple to run this tool, as I'll show you later. So I wanted to talk a bit about the printers that we have. The first printer is this control flow graph printer, and it'll pr print, print something called a control flow graph of, the, uh, of every function in your smart contract. The control flow graph is, as it sounds, a graph that basically displays all possible execution paths. So every node that you have in a graph is this idea of a basic block, which is just code that executes without branches. And then every single edge is like a program jump or a split in control flow. So this is pretty nice because if you want to have a like, more low level understanding of the, uh, your code, it'll show all the Sierra statements. And it's also good for if you just want to like, learn more about the Sierra intermediate representation. So minimal example here, let's say we have this uh, simple function add or sub. If there's an if statement, so the, if the uh, parameter is less than 10, we're going to add. Otherwise, we're going to subtract. And here's what the CFE looks like. Because we don't have the source mapping, it's, this is all done at the Sierra level. So what will happen is we'll have a basic block, as you can see. And then we'll basic, basically, depending on the branch condition, we'll go to one of two other basic blocks. And this, if you look back, this basically corresponds to one of the two cases that we have. So, in one case, we will add something, and in the other case, we'll subtract something. If you look, you'll see that instruction 6 and instruction 12 are like both sub and add. So another printer that's a bit more high level and probably more useful if you're a developer is this idea of a call graph printer, which will just basically print all the function calls and all the cross-contract calls in a given contract. So this is useful if you want to basically see how like what functions call what other functions and kind of just have like a pictorial visual visualization of what your contract does. It'll also be important for like seeing when you use any sort of external dependencies. And let's say I have this contract with this, you know, a bunch of functions that do various things, and they call each other, or they call some other functions. I can run it on my t on the tool, and then we have this nice pictorial representation. As we can see, there's a function that doesn't call anything. There's a function that calls an internal function, and that function also it does recursion, so it calls back into itself. We have a function that is an external call to some other uh, trait. So. I wanted to briefly explain how Caracol works. And there are roughly four steps on what happens. So the first thing we'll do is we obviously need to compile the contracts and recover some information from the program artifacts that are generated. Like I said earlier, uh, this is built on top of the Sierra IR, so we need the actual like, in program information at the IR level. Then we're going to start to set like meta information about the program. I'll go into that a bit later. Then after that, we can build the CFG. Remember that uh, like graph I showed you earlier, we can construct that. And then I'm going to do uh, data flow analysis and taint analysis to learn more information. So I'll go into these steps a bit more. But that's not working. So OK, what taint analysis is is that I can determine if a variable is tainted, which means that it's tainted if a user input will control it in some way. So let's say I have an external function with a bunch of parameters. Those parameters can be entirely determined by the user. and what we'll do in taint analysis is we have these sources, which are just variables that provide taint. Like I said, they're mainly just inputs to external functions, because those are completely user controlled. Then we have sinks, which are variables that use sources. So taint analysis is really simple. All we do is we just map sources to each of their sinks. And this is useful because we can use this to detect things like overflow and underflow. Also, the controlled library call is a very uh, simple application of taint analysis because we can see if the library call is tainted by that class, ha class hash, and same for the unchecked L1 handler. So going back to the uh, compilation, so the first thing we'll do, oh, yeah, there's a question. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was about taint, how taint analysis affects storage variables. And yeah, as you said, yeah, so taint analysis will uh, do that. So let's say like I have an external parameter, and then I'll write to something like a storage variable. That variable will also become tainted too. So every time that variable is used, it'll propagate taint to like wherever it touches to. So, yeah, good question. Uh, 
So going back to like the compilation, which is the first step of what has to happen, we obviously need like some information about the program to be able to do analysis on it. So we'll basically compile the contracts, take the Sierra intermediate representation, and then just parse it to create some sort of like a program structure. This program basically contains all the functions, all the like you know declarations and the pro like types that are used in the contract. Then we can generate these things called compilation units, which kind of just you can think of them as an abstraction over like the underlying contract. So they have the ABI, the program registry, and all the functions used. So once since we have this information, we can now start to actually like set meta information about the about each function. So the meta information are things that you know would be useful for analysis. For example, like the function's type, is it internal, external, like view, public? Does it write to storage, read from storage? Does it emit events? Does it do any in internal calls, et cetera? So once we have like data from the Sierra IR, we can just basically populate all this information. And then once we have the information, we can actually just build a control flow graph over each function. So the control flow graph, as I mentioned, is just basically a bunch of basic blocks with edges that dictate the control flow. And this is going to be useful for data flow analysis. So data flow analysis is a very powerful like uh, program analysis technique. What we do is, without running the program, we'll just use the control flow graph to determine some information about it. So when you actually, like, this is a common technique used in compilers as well. Like, for example, if you've ever written code and then, you know, the compiler will tell you this code is dead, it, it can do that via uh, data flow analysis. It can also do some optimizations, like it can tell you if, some, if something is going to be constant throughout the execution of the program, it can use data flow analysis to detect that, and then basically, instead of having a variable, it can just replace it with the constant you use. There are typically two types of uh, analysis. So there's forwards analysis, where we basically traverse the graph going forward. And then there's backwards analysis, which, as you can imagine, just traverses it in the opposite direction. We're going to track the information at each program point in the CFG and then apply this thing called a transfer function. You can think of the transfer function as basically a way to transfer information from one program point to another. And then we just keep iterating that function. So that's a little bit abstract, but this is useful for detecting something like reentrancy. To put it concretely, we have a reentrancy does a forwards analysis. So we're going to have some sort of set of information. In this case, the, it's going to be the variables that are read to before our call. And then the transfer function will basically just keep propagating that information right up until we reach uh, external call. And then it'll also look at the variables that are touched after the external call. And then what, we just keep iterating that until we know what variables are read before the call, what variables are written to after, and then we can match them to detect a reentrancy. So I actually have this uh, demo that I'd like to show you to show that it's like really simple to run our tool. So sorry, please work. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you. Uh, there's one change that you have to do when you're running Caracal. If you use like SCARB, for example, you're just going to have to add these two lines, which are fairly simple. Just make sure that your target is a StarkNet contract and that you want we want to replace the program IDs. So let's just, in, this is the file that we're going to investigate. As you can see, it just basically a toy file with a bunch of storage, and it has a whole bunch of vulnerabilities. In fact, it has like literally every vulnerability that I described, so do not use this in production. Okay, so oh, of course it has to go at the best time. So let's go back. So it, can you just pause, dude? Okay. So the command to run Caracal is literally just Caracal detect, and then you just run it from the root of the directory. So it's like extremely simple to run. Like, and as you can see, it compiles it, and it detects literally every vulnerability that I talked about, and it'll basically have some nice colors to show the impact. As you can see, the impact of reentrancy is medium, and we think that there's a medium, we have medium confidence in how we determine it. We also have some things like that are low severity, but they're just optimizations. Like as you can see, we have unused arguments. So if an argument isn't used, it's not a vulnerability per se, but it probably shouldn't be in the code. And like I was saying, also we also have a bunch of printers that you can use. So the what, what will happen is when we write, write a printer, it'll print it in this sort of dot format. And if any of you are familiar with dot format, it's just a format used to like display things graphically. So the dot format outputted is just like, as you can see, if I typed it correctly, 
It's just going to be a bunch of statements about a graph, and you can use any sort of external tool like graph is to basically render this and generate a nice picture. And in addition to the, um, the sorry, in addition to the uh, CFG printer, which is a bit more low level, we also have this like uh, call graph printer, which is really useful because what this will do is basically it'll just show you all the calls like I mentioned. So I actually have a picture of that because I don't think most people can imagine what the graph looks like just from seeing this graph is code. Uh, so this is what I went over. And so this is, as you can see, the resolution is pretty bad for some reason, but it's just the uh, CFG. And then if we run the call graph, this is how it looks for the example that we have. It shows functions that don't call anything, functions that, you know, call something, and then functions that make external calls. So the tool was, uh, we've been in development for a bit, but we just like open sourced it last month, and it's obviously still a very big work in progress. So some of the things that we want to do is we want to add more detectors and printers because there are probably a lot more things that we can detect statically, and we want to make, obviously, find as many vulnerabilities as we can. We want to remove some false positives in existing uh, like detectors and printers we have because this isn't like 100% accurate. Obviously, sometimes we'll run the tool and it'll say there could be a potential risk when there isn't one, and we want to remove as many of them as we can. Also, something we want to do is if you notice, we only have the Sierra information available, which is kind of low level and makes it really hard to read because it's just a bunch of like variable IDs and it doesn't actually have the like source map. So if you guys have done any work with something like uh, you know, a debugger and IDE, it'll actually show you like the line of code, like the, in the code, the lines that go wrong, and we want to add that when they add that information to the Cairo compiler. And also, we want to improve our data flow analysis. There is a bunch of other like cool program analysis techniques we want to integrate. We want to make our analysis like faster and more efficient as well. So, this has been a uh, uh, talk about Caracol, which is like a new static analysis tool. We would, if any of you are developing something, we'd highly, highly recommend. Uh, to run it because it's really easy. It can detect, you know, common vulnerabilities that you may introduce, which I'm sure you don't want in your code. And also, uh, yeah, it'll also point out some optimizations. Like, if you have any issues, we'll also like just feel free to submit them on our GitHub because we're uh, it's still in progress and it's very much a work in progress. And we're happy to like you know fix any issues or give any support. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Oh, it can be run on Mac OS. We have the binaries for Mac, Windows, everything. It's just a like Rust project. Okay. Yeah. Oh, what system is this oh, so that's like kind of what we believe, like just because our job is we audit a lot of code bases, and it's kind of just like a subjective thing. We think like, for example, that some things are like we some things are a little bit harder to detect, so we have a little bit less confidence because we can't be a hundred percent sure. And then some things are very high impact, like if there's an overflow and underflow, for example, we think that's pretty high impact because you know it can lead to like people minting infinite money, which is not a good thing. Oh, that's actually a great uh, question. So the idea or the question was about like if we plan to make like to integrate this with an LSP, and that's definitely something we'll consider. Right now, it's not like our highest priority because we want to get the tool to be in like you know a much like better state first before we like do like language server integrations. But yeah, that's definitely a cool idea, and we'll probably like investigate it at some point. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Awesome.